Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Britt and I'm the Director of Senior Living and Healthcare here at Belter Food Service Design, Equipment and Supply. I believe hospitality and senior living go hand in hand. All of us are looking for ways to create memorable experiences, whether at home with our family and friends or in communities with our residents during mealtime in a social setting, which is why a food service and food and beverage program is so important. I'm very excited to announce we have partnered with Aaron Fish of Trestle Hospitality Concepts to bring you today's presentation, a proactive approach to consistent senior living food and beverage programs. A seasoned senior living executive with nearly 30 years of experience in hospitality and senior living realms, Aaron's focus has been on elevating the customer experience. Starting with his career with some of the top hospitality organizations like Airmark, Marriott, and the Broadmoor Hotel, he has honed his expertise and unique ability to build customer-focused food and hospitality programs and operations. Before we begin, a quick note that our in-house expert, Matt, will be assisting with questions, so please submit questions via the QA button. We'll do our very best to answer them after Aaron's presentation. And now, with further, without further ado, I present Mr. Aaron Fish. Thanks, Britt. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about the, the partnership with Belter. And so um, let's not wait any longer. Let's just jump right in and start talking about uh, the proactive approach to consistent senior living food and beverage operations. So where I want to start with this is I want to start and talk about hospitality as a strategic initiative. You know, and what does this really look like, right? And so one of the things that we talk a lot about in senior living, and you see it when you read newsletters and you, you talk to industry experts, we talk a lot about the healthcare that we offer and the real estate that we manage, right? And so, you know, those are very important pieces of the puzzle when it comes to supporting our, our communities and our, our customers. But I really truly believe that the third leg of a three-legged stool of senior living is hospitality. You know, hospitality shouldn't be considered a second tier initiative. Um, you know, it's it has its value and it brings value to, to the other uh, legs of the stool. So, you know, it provides that stability and support. So that way you have the overall success of your senior living uh, community uh, to happen. You know, it can increase the value of real estate, uh, it can reduce liability in healthcare, and, and I think one of the things that we get a, a lost in a lot is when we talk about hospitality, most people think of that like five-star resort-style community. You know, we spend a lot of time giving out awards for who has the best design, the best layouts, the best amenities, and those are all really important, and we're definitely going to talk about that, but when we're talking about hospitality as a an strategic initiative, it's not just for that luxury resort or model. You know, think about like just providing five star service with whatever you're doing. So you're in rural Texas or rural Kansas or wherever, you know, those people don't have necessarily the the expectation of the best and brightest and the shiniest. But what they want is they want, consistent service. They want people to know who they are. They want things to be done right, and they want them to be done well. And so I think when you look at it that way, it's really important to really understand hospitality is not just luxury. It's really there to be uh, to bring that personal touch uh, in an industry of people serving people uh, to what we do in senior living. Aaron, I have to say that your example of a three-legged stool is, is truly brilliant. It's a great analogy. Um, one of the things I'm really intrigued about and I want you to speak a little bit further about is this, can you give us examples of how hospitality can impact the real estate and healthcare legs of the stool? Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, let's start with real estate first, right? You know, we're always trying to make our, our owners and our investors happy, you know, and they want some return on their investment. Well, using hospitality, there's a couple of really good ways to increase the actual value of the property. You know, I worked with an operator where, you know, we were looking at adding um, an alcohol license, full service alcohol for our residents, um, something they had been asking for. We started looking at it. And as we kind of did the full analysis, 
what we realized was that simply adding that $10,000 two-year annual license was going to add almost a quarter of a million dollars in value to the oh, real estate wow. just by having that, not even talking about the service, right? And so just that in and of itself is one example. Another is increasing revenues. You know, we're constantly talking about how do we get census up and census up, right? Well, when you're planning and doing pro formas, you kind of already know what that value of that property is based on how many units and what the occupancy is. Well, if you want to add and stack on top of that value, just increasing food and hospitality revenues by, let's say, $5,000 a month, right? We're talking just around six hundred or 60000 a year. Um, by doing that, the value of a community could increase by half a million to three quarters of a million dollars. Um, you know, and I think five thousand dollars per month in most of our operations is probably under what could be easily accomplished. So from a real estate perspective, there's there's a couple of opportunities just right there. Um, wow. And when we look at uh, healthcare, you know, it's it. Let's think about like clinical outcomes, right? That's really what's important. Um, we know socialization has a ton of value. Um, just thinking about cognitive decline, people who were had more frequent social contact had seventy percent less than those with low social activity. And so, bringing hospitality, bringing in more resident engagement, elevating the uh, the ser food service and the dining experiences. Is going to create that socialization, and so you're going to increase that those outcomes. And we can talk about nutrition all day. You know, there's so, lots of things that can happen. You know, you can get uh, increased cardiovascular function. You can reduce in re infection risk, accelerate wound healing, um, and something as simple as uh, you know making sure that you have healthy green leafy greens and salmon and a variety of menu choices, which is part of that hospitality experience. Is going to is going to increase those things. So there there's a number of ways that you can use hospitality and food service and resident engagement to really stabilize this three legged stool. No, and I really like what you've said about um, just the nutrition part because wellness has been such a huge trend in terms of senior living focus, right? So we're seeing yeah. that not just from like the food service operations, but also from from architects where I'm hearing more and more about biophilic design. And that's really design that's about nature and how can we incorporate design and nature mm -hmm. and have an impact on the wellness of these seniors. Because as we know, a lot of them do suffer from loneliness and depression that's very prevalent uh, you know, within the senior living population. Yeah, I have a design partner that I work with. Uh, last conversation we had at a trade show, we were talking about lighting and senior living. And how with the right lighting and the right systems, you can actually mimic the, the rhythms of the sun and the daylight and the tones and the kind of impact that can have on health. So there's a number of ways to do this. And again, it all comes back to thinking about hospitality strategically, long term, and what value it can bring. So, you know, we've kind of talked about the, the what does it look like? What, so why should we do it, right? I think that's another important question that we really need to answer for people. Um, and for me, there really is three way, reasons to do this. Um, the first is obviously, you know, our ability to recruit and retain top talent. You know, we're starting to maybe see some softening in the, the labor market as far as in our favor, but we still got a long ways to go. Um, but to get that hospitality and to get those individuals that come from hospitality and culinary programs, because we all know that we've got a shifting demographic to appease, right? And mm -hmm. so we're gonna need that skill set in our kitchen. The days of hiring uh, a $10 an hour cook to open cans and cook frozen lasagna is over. And so we wanna start positioning our operations to bring those people in, right? And I think that's gonna be important because we always talk about while senior living provides better quality of life, better, better work hours, competitive wages, all of those things are there, uh, but we just have to really emphasize it more. I think the, the, the last piece on this, I think is so important, is these professionals don't see it as a career path. You know, I, 
I did a guest lecture uh, at my alma mater last week. And one of the things that was surprising was I talked to them about senior living was them asking that particular question, well, what can we do if we get into senior living? And I could have talked for an hour about all the different career paths and the things they could do. And they were stunned. They had never even realized that was an option. And so it was so eye-opening to see that and let them see that, yes, if you're a hospitality professional, there is a very, very good career path here that's going to have a lot of great things for your work-life balance in the future. Yeah, I actually agree. I, I worked in a restaurants years and years ago during college. And one of the things that I hear from chefs is that have transitioned into the senior living segment is like you said, better hours, there's benefits. They don't have to work late hours and they have time to spend with their family. But the biggest thing that I hear about is really the impact. They feel like they're really making a difference. They have the ability to truly change someone's experience with a great meal or a special event and what have you. And I think that we're all looking for that, right? To make a positive impact on the people that we we know we come into contact with. Yeah, I call it hospitality with a purpose. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're right on with that, absolutely. The, the second thing on the why is, I'm gonna talk specifically about like food and beverage revenues because I think that's probably the biggest ancillary opportunity in most of our operations. And this is an untapped resource, right? You know, we talked just a little bit ago about the value increasing revenue brings to just property. Well, if we're talking about, you know, cash strapped operations and our, our, our occupancy numbers aren't where we want them to be, but we got to recruit uh, potential employees. Well, how do we find the budget to pay for that? How do we enhance our resident engagement programs? How do we offer more without having to raise rents, right? And make ourselves less competitive in the market. And so, you know, these revenues, yes, they can be used to meet those NOI goals for your communities, but really, truly, if you just look at it as a resource in general, maybe one month you hit the NOI numbers and the next month you use it to uh, develop a service fee pool. So you pay your, your staff the uh, maybe a little bit lower wage, but they get revenue sharing. You know, we did that back in the hotels all the time for, for banquets and catering. Um, you know, we want to add some new technology in the resident engagement realm. Well, we got to pay for those subscriptions these revenues could definitely help do that. And so there's definitely a way to do this. And, and when you think about using that revenue creatively, creativity, creatively, ugh, couldn't <laughs> say it, creatively, you know, I you just got to think about how important revenue is out in the, the restaurant world and that profit mentality. So I think it's really important to, to look at it from that angle, as opposed to the typical food is an expense we have to manage perspective. And then that last, the last one is brand awareness isn't just for your prospects, right? We're not just recruiting uh, residents, right? We have to recruit adult children. Uh, at this point, maybe even adult grandchildren, uh, maybe a brother or a sister uh, who's not sure that maybe they should move in, uh, employees, uh, everybody, right, is kind of a prospect nowadays. And so, you know, you can use hospitality and your programming around it to help define your brand and really kind of do this, right? You know, think about just from an employee perspective, um, using it for recruitment and getting these great videos on like TikTok or an Instagram reel where, you know, you see all these guys and gals doing food and you see chefs on there showing off what they do. Those get a lot of hits. You know, I did a presentation just last month and there's over... 500 million posts just on Instagram under the hashtag food, right? And so think about if 10 people saw each one of those posts and you could be a part of that if you if you start using this and it's stuff you're already doing with your operation. You know, some other things, it shows off your community culture and pride. You know, there's a lot of amazing things happening in senior living. We do great food, we do great care, we build great relationships and create family atmospheres. And so doing this and using these opportunities for brand awareness is, is so great. And, and I really think the last thing, which is probably the biggest, and I we still see it today. I saw uh, some, some articles and some posts about some negative connotations around what we do. 
you know, and that institutional mindset, that institutional food service, you know, we're going to, the, the media is going to glom onto the negative, right? That's what's going to get them their clicks, get them their views. So we have to overwhelm all of that with the positive. And there's so much opportunity with resident engagement and dining and food service and uh, all of the activities that happen in the community. You know, we're, we're doing healthcare two, three, maybe four hours a day and residents are sleeping eight. So that's 12 out of 24 hours at most. So what are we doing with the other 12? Let's use it. Let's capitalize it. Let's make a great experience for everybody involved. I agree. And I think branding is such a big topic right now as well. I mean, we are doing this in restaurants and hospitality every single day. We see it with country clubs. So why wouldn't some of the same principles apply to senior living? And there's so many senior living corporations and communities that really want to take it to the next level. And I just see this as like the next natural step. It could be beyond logos on your napkins, right? Like you can really make it as comprehensive or uh, tiny little details to whatever degree you see fit for your community. Yeah, the idea nowadays is you just need to create restaurants, the end. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity for that. And so kind of the, you know, the, the, the what, you know, what do we need to do? What do we need to have in place for hospitality as a strategic initiative? Well, there's a few things. First, we have to really approach it as everyone is a customer, not just the residents we're serving, but the families, their guests, the employees, the friends of the employees, vendors that come in, like every single person needs to be a customer. And when we start our, when we develop trainings around that mindset, when we develop programs around that, you know, just thinking about a vending program that you do in-house for employees, a lot of people outsource those things. Well, why not bring it in-house? You make revenue, you get an employee perk. Now we're looking at that employee as a customer. How can we serve them with what we do? And I think that's uh, that's a really important what as far as uh, execution. The next is, I, I kind of hinted at it earlier, this profit mentality, right? Restaurants are profitable and successful because of what they do, their approach to service, their approach to food and presentation, the way they treat their customers. And so everybody has to think that if we stop serving good meals tomorrow, or if we aren't able to execute the best activities for our residents, then we might actually close this community down. Because in the long run, that's what's going to happen. You're going to get move outs and negative reviews. And so Everybody has to be thinking, I need to make money off of this, not necessarily for the bottom line, but for how can we generate profit that we can then reinvest in our community? Well, and that profit mentality, like, again, we see it in hospitality businesses. So, for example, even in restaurants and a lot of businesses where food is a big part of it, the focus is on reducing waste. We see this with farm to table uh -huh. concepts. Um, I think that it's just like, you, you had an example when we talked a while back yeah. about just how much loss we see on a daily basis, not just in restaurants, but in senior living. Do yeah. you remember that? Yeah, no, so this was back in uh, 2019, 2020. So the data might have changed a little bit, but there was a, a study done where they compared waste in restaurants uh, to what happened in senior living. And it's because of the model and how it was executed. Restaurants were doing somewhere between seven and 9% per, uh, waste of food cost. Whereas in senior living, the number was 20%. And so if you think about a $10 a day PRD for a hundred residents, now all of a sudden I'm, I'm losing $200 a day just being thrown away. I mean, that's $6,000 a month. And you do that times 12, that's uh, what, $72,000 a year. I mean, that's some frontline employees, right? So you're right. The waste is so important. And if everybody thinks about how do I maximize what I'm doing, it'll go a long way. Which kind of leads to my next point, right? This commitment to excellence, right? It's going to impact the service we provide, the food we give, the engagement activities we create. Uh, and it's going to really force us to be our best. And it's about 
not about maximizing labor or any of that. It's about trying to get the best out of everyone every single day. And so we've got to be committed to doing that and doing things the right way. And, and the best way to really do that, honestly, is to create that strong operational foundation, right? And we're going to dive into this a little bit. But doing this is where you start. And all of the things kind of build on top of that, which I think is going to be really important for, for, for going forward and really making that uh, being proactive and being consistent with your operation. So one of the things that I think is really important is valuing consistency, right? There's, there's this quote by John Maxwell, and everybody's familiar with him, great business leader. Um, you know, small disciplines repeated with consistency every day lead to great achievements gained slowly over time, right? It's kind of, let's do the things the right way every single day, get better, you know, this, uh, there's a ton of sports analogies that you could use here about we won today, we're going to build on today for tomorrow and, you know, be one and know, whatever, however you want to look at it, right? But th this mindset of valuing consistency is really, truly going to make a difference when you're looking at being a, a, a really solid, strong operator. And I agree, Aaron, like it's really about the marathon, right? It's uh, it's not a sprint. It's small changes, baby steps every day, yep. right? And I think that change in general is very hard for most of us. I mean, I, I don't think I'm in the minority. And But what I find is when you're making changes in any kind of community or setting, transparency is really the key. Just helping everyone understand the why behind why you're making these changes, uh, making sure that you have buy-in from the top executives, right? Like you're not going to be able to move the needle if your CEO, your president, your leader is not on the same page, correct? Absolutely. No, and, and that's really uh, leads us into the next piece here, right? So why value consistency, right? Like everybody kind of inherently goes, oh, well, yeah, I need to be consistent. That makes a lot of sense, right? But what's the real value in it, right? Like, what do you get out of it? Why do I need to do this? And so I've got kind of five points that I think are really important that kind of get us to that. Um, and so point one is that we build trust with employees and residents, right? And what I mean by this is the more consistent we are, our residents will trust what they're going to get um, you know, I talked about five-star service, but it being maybe in a, a mid-market setting. You know, if you're consistent and you promise meatloaf on Tuesdays and you execute meatloaf, that five-star service and that consistent execution is going to blow the doors off of those residents. They're going to love you. They're going to think you're amazing, you know, and, and that's the kind of thing that consistency brings. And with employees, you know, employees want to know what they're, they're, they're supposed to be doing, right? Gallup has done surveys on what makes employees happy and knowing what's expected of them is at the top of the list. It's top three or four. And so they see consistency. Therefore, they begin to trust that you're going to do what you say. And maybe they don't like what you say, but they know you're going to be consistent and you're going to follow through. And it's so important in creating a stable foundation for your operation. The, the second is the accountability loop, right? And so we're creating this accountability loop where it's not just me as a manager holds Brit the server accountable for a job, right? It becomes, I trust that you know what you're doing and you trust that I know what I'm doing. And so now we can hold each other accountable, right? You know, if I start to have a, a slack day and you go, Britt, the server says, hey, you know, we need to we need to check these people out or we need to do ABC. You know, it's important that we do that, right? It, same thing with residents and guests, you know, getting them to trust us means, especially in our senior living settings, they're going to give us feedback, but we want to have good feedback, right? Just you know, if it falls on deaf ears, they'll stop, right? And that's the worst thing that can happen. And so we're creating multiple accountability loops with being consistent. And it really, truly creates a better environment and atmosphere for everybody involved. The third one is consistency is going to establish your reputation and relevance, right? And, and what I mean by this is that think about restaurants out there, restaurants that can do the same thing over and over. 
Well, you know their reputation, good, bad, or indifferent, and the better their reputation, the more relevant they are in the market, right? You know, I think about, you know, think about a resident, for, you know, Miss Sally, right? If you're giving her a great meal every single day in the dining room, or maybe you're doing things consistently and there are items that she's told you she doesn't like on the menu, but you have other alternatives and you're always able to find it and she sees that, yes, you're consistent, right? Well, she's going to start talking about that, maybe to her friends, you know, maybe she's at the grocery store and sees somebody she hasn't seen for a while and you're going to start to build that, that positive. Well, think about the reverse of that, right? If you're not consistent, that she's going to go out and she's going to complain to everybody, her daughter, her, her friends at the bridge club, she's going to be in the grocery store. Well, I got to buy groceries because it keeps growing up in the dining room. And so those are going to happen a lot more frequently. So by doing, being consistent, you're going to push her to the positive and away from the negative. And so it's really going to help you uh, establish your reputation and your relevance in the marketplace. Well, and word of mouth is definitely such a much stronger recommendation, right? Than just a social media post from someone anonymous. I mean, that's what people really want to hear. They want to hear from the residents that are in that community and they want to hear about their experiences. Yeah. Well, and that social media post goes both ways, right? Like you see a picture of awful food. I mean, it's red alert. Everybody is all hands on deck to it, get to it. But you see someone showing off the food, well, that can get just as viral, um, which is amazing. So um, fourth point I want to make is it makes your goals measurable, right? And so I think it's, you think about, I need to set goals for my team. How do we improve every day? How do we get better? Well, if we're consistent in doing what we need to do every day, this the, these goals can become measurable and we can start putting them in place, right? Absolutely. And do you mind giving us a goal, like just an example of, you know, a goal that can, that is easily measured? I think all of us kind of struggle with, with how to define these goals and how to actually keep, you know, keep me measuring them. Yeah. So, you know, one that I think everybody can, can look at is resident satisfaction. You know, we want our resident satisfaction numbers to be high, you know, and so being consistent in a process on gathering the information obviously is the starting point to be able to say yes we've got a now we've got a measurement now we know how what to attack but then looking at how you build a plan for that right so we need to do better more consistent server training we need to talk about it every day at our pre-service meeting and we need to do a weekly breakdown with managers on customer service points and things to look for in the dining room you know maybe we do a high, a high level training with management on customer service in general, you know, and then we start looking at, well, now that we've got training in place, what are some of the touch points, right? Is, is the food coming out on time? We're doing measuring ticket times. Can we get that number down? And so you can find metrics inside of all of those things that impact satisfaction, but the only way that those metrics are gonna be worth anything is if you're consistently measuring them consistently following through on them and making sure that everything is in place. And then you can start making sure that goal is where you want it to be. So, uh, and my fifth point is increased productivity, right? We're trying to squeeze every minute out of every day to get the most out of what we have available to us, right? And so the more consistent we are, the better staff become at their jobs through training, through just repetition, kind of through muscle memory even, you know, and they become better at what they do. And then they become able to take on more, become willing to take on more. And so it really does uh, increase your overall productivity uh, to a level that you might be surprised with your consistency. And so uh, the last thing I'll say on this is, I, you know, consistency is what transforms average into excellent. You know, it just, these things all come together and are going to push and elevate uh, yourself. And it all starts with being consistent. So we we're, we're, we kind of laid some groundwork there, but how do we really create that foundation, right? That's kind of why everybody's here and listening in and, and wants to kind of get to that, that point of what we're talking about. 
Well, I have a, a process that I call minding your P's and Q. And I think it's really valuable. It's easy to relate to, and it makes things really clear for people as we uh, start talking about building a foundation for your operation. And so uh, our P's, we have people, we have process, we have product, and then our Q is quality management. And so I want to dive into these a little bit, and I, just so everybody can kind of understand why each of these is important and how they play a part in building that strong foundation uh, for your operation. So I like to ask a question for each of these, right, to an operator. So like, what are you doing to invest in your employees through the offer letter, through the time they leave with you, right? And so uh, I think it's really important to think about that. You know, you've got to hire well, you've got to onboard better, and you've got to train continuously, right? Those are kind of the three keys for this, I think are so important. Um, you know, for hiring, you've got to have a consistent process, right? Uh, the, the best example of a not consistent process was I had a chef manager one time complaining about, I can't keep people, I keep getting bad applicants, just a, a litany of excuses. Well, we sat with him to do interviews just to kind of, let's figure out what's going on. How can we help him? He interviewed seven individuals in about 48 minutes. And it was amazing to me that he kind of lost everything because um, he was really just like, when are you available? Can you be here? Do you look presentable? He was not diving in and he wasn't asking the same question. So his the process he was using was broken. So you got to have a repeatable process that will let you compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Um, and one that'll let you find training opportunities for the right people. You know, um, onboarding, the, the one thing I'll say about onboarding, we know how important it is. Um, two things, one, it starts at day negative 14. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the day they give notice, accept your offer and tell their current employer they're leaving, that's when onboarding starts. So however you can communicate in that two or three or four weeks, whatever the time is, um, communicating with emails or notes, um, setting them up for maybe some training online ahead of time, whatever you can do to stay connected. So that way, when they walk in the door, you know, having their office ready, having a name badge ready for them, having their uniforms together, all of those things make a huge impact on retaining people. So it's really important that that you really take that in consideration, you know, and then training continuously, like it never stops, right? Onboarding never stops, training never stops. And so you've got to find all the right touch points to make sure you're touching and working with your employees to get them constantly trained. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's very easy to hire for the personality uh, because of skills. You can train someone the skills, right? So, so, so oftentimes yes. we talk about people, they're like, oh, their resume and this and this, and they've done this. But sometimes for, depending on the position, if you have someone that's really engaged and energetic and they're motivated, you can teach them the skills. I mean, there's nothing Absolutely. you can't teach them. And I think I agree with you that training is one of the most important ways of, of not necessarily managing your team, but really empowering them, giving them, you know, the confidence to know that they're doing a, a great job and being successful in your community. No, I agree. Absolutely. You know, and that hiring process is so important to that, right? Because you can find the blind spots for training if you have a consistent process, right? Like if I hire a sous chef for their skill set, uh, I mean, they can wow me with what they know and that's great. But if they have a horrible personality, they're going to run people off and they're going to just, the kitchen's going to be a disaster. And so I would rather hire a sous chef that maybe isn't confident in some of their skills or maybe a little green with making the mother sauces because I can train that to you. There are resources and tools galore out there to make that happen. So it, it's, you're right. Hiring for personality, finding the blind spots and training the skills is so, so important when it comes to your people. So the next is process, right? And so 
developing and standardizing processes is, is going to allow your team to kind of work efficiently and productively. Um, you know, I, I will say this, you know, I have over my time in, in, as a senior living executive, I well, probably the biggest thing I learned when it comes to process is you have to know what works, right? So I have in my time made some of the biggest, most amazing, most beautiful department manuals you've ever seen, right? I, I'm willing to put them next to anything that anybody ever has created. And those manuals wind up, wound up sitting on shelves. They got dusty. People didn't know what I was referring to when I mentioned the manual. And the reason for that is, is that it's not geared to be useful and effective for the frontline employees, right? You've got to have operating standard operating procedures that are easy to use and they create consistency for your staff, right? And so when you're creating those uh, standard operating procedures, you just got to think about what am I using already that maybe could be a, a standard operating procedure? You know, you just got to have the basic pieces of those in place, but you can build on things you already have or things that you have to have, you know? One of the best examples that I like to give is the the hand washing sign, right? You know, there's a there's everybody needs to have a sign posted, but you can also talk about why they have to wash their hands, after what activities they have to wash their hands. You can post these are symptoms of illness that you need to like have it all right there and posted. And now you've got a standard operating procedure that employees are going to use because it's in front of them, it's easy, it's accessible, and it's not in a binder up on a shelf. And so that's really important when you're you're doing that. So you got to make them easy to use. And it's really important to review and update them on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of cheat sheets. I found that when I've worked in kitchens years back, like nobody really had the time to, like you said, go through the manual or read a lot of stuff. Like they just felt they were busy. So we just started creating cheat sheets for what they really needed to know and try to keep them under like five <laughs> five things or less, because it was just easier to remember that than ah. try to remember all those other things. So yeah, I agree with you. I think that it's very, but it's also, like you said, very important to like review and update them on a regular basis. Something that worked two years ago may not be working right now. No, absolutely. No, your cheat sheet example, it, it's funny because I thinking back, and I don't know why I didn't realize this sooner in my career, right? Working in hotels and restaurants and then shifting over to senior living everybody was always like, oh yeah, no, here's our quick checklist or, oh, here's the sheet that we created for that. And as always looking back on it now, I'm like, well, duh, right? Like you're absolutely right. It was because they had one of those big, beautiful manuals that was completely pointless on a shelf. So um, one of the things I will say, and you, you, you kind of teased it a little bit was uh, reviewing and updating it, right? You've got to have some sort of master outline for them you got to make sure that everybody reviews it. And when you review it, make sure that you include not just your corporate team or a select group of uh, really high performing culinary or food and beverage directors. Get servers, get dishwashers, get maybe even get a resident. Uh, get a team that's going to touch that at every single point, because like you said, things are going to change there maybe is a better way that the service staff has created, or maybe your host has figured out, and you want to incorporate that. Because again, at the end of the day, we're trying to develop processes so we can be efficient and productive. You know, track it, update it, and make sure you've got a catalog somewhere that you can always refer to. So when we're talking about our third P here, product, um, you know, to have a successful food and beverage operation, you've got to deliver the promised product to your customers, right? And, and I, the question I ask on this one is, can your leadership team manage and maintain your product standards throughout the entire life cycle of a meal? And, and I think what gets lost in this a lot of times when we talk about food and beverage operations is that the product we talk about well, what kind of shrimp are we buying today? Are we getting fresh green beans or are we doing frozen? And we're thinking about the physical food that we're serving. And it's very, very important, don't get me wrong. But when we're talking about product and building a strong food and beverage program and the foundation for it, we have to look at the entirety of the product. What does the service look like? But think of it 
as the journey of the plate, if you will, right? So think about that plate leaving the dish machine and it's brand new, piping hot, ready for service. Where does that plate go? And what journey does it take all the way through the operation back to when it goes back in the dish machine the next time, right? You've got product coming in the back door. You've got cooks prepping it. You've got cooks cooking it. You've got them plating the presentation. You've got servers making sure it moves on time. You've got residents and, and are they eating it right? Are the, is the dining room flow happening and not bottlenecking? Um, are we busting tables fast enough? All of these things, is our dish pit organized, right? All of these things are part of that product because it's the experience and, and the, the satisfaction we're creating with our, our residents, right? And so, you know, you've got to establish the system for all of those things, which we talked about, but you also need to manage the specifications. And I think the most important piece is understanding your customer, right? You know, we talked a little bit ago about the shifting demographic. You know, we are just now starting to see older baby boomers come into our communities. And what we offered five and 10 years ago is not what they want, is not what they expect. They want a totally different experience from us. And so if we don't understand those customers, what we're doing may be great, but it's not going to evolve and it's not going to take into consideration what they want. And so I think it's really important for that. Um, you know, I, I kind of think about the, the four principles of food service that I, I use with product. You know, we got to talk about the product specifications, which I mentioned. And then we talk about a continuous flow of, of product and service and people, you know. And then we got to talk about the division of labor and being efficient. And then lastly, reducing that wasted effort. We don't want those four things to be lost as we go through doing this. And so it's really important to think about the service that you're providing and the experience you're creating as the whole product and not just the food on the plate. If you do just the food on the plate, yes, you're going to do great meals, but you're going to miss a lot of opportunities to really maximize and create a solid operation for your food and beverage program. And so the last piece of the minding your P's and Q is quality management, right? And, and I really think what's important here is, does your team create the checks and balances needed to keep the operation consistent and moving at a high level, right? And so, you know, every successful food and beverage operation must have quality management as a part of it, right? And so we, we hear people talk about quality control a lot, but there's the other side of that, which is quality assurance. And I, you gotta understand both of those and know that quality assurance and quality control are gonna be required if you really want this to be successful. Well, and especially because you wanna be proactive in this process versus just reacting to, to things that are happening, correct? No, absolutely. And I think that's that's where we, we miss this a lot, right? We We live, a lot of times in the reactive side of things, like the food, we're, we're out of food, we gotta make more. Uh, the resident wasn't happy, so we gotta make this, or somebody told us something was bad, so we gotta fix it, you know? That's quality control, right? Like doing things that are reactive, like testing the food before we serve it. That is reacting to what is being done in the kitchen. We gotta fix it because it's not right, you know? So quality control being reactive, you know, it's product oriented, um, you know, what does the end product look like? It's ingredient focused. So what's the input of the food? What, what is that? What's the output of that look like? We're verifying things. It's verification center. So think about like doing line checks, um, you know, ask table touches. Those are all verifying that what we're doing is working, you know, and this is usually assigned to specific people, right? So we don't have everybody taste the food, right? Usually it's the chef, the two chef, uh, maybe a manager on duty. Um, you know, who's doing table touches, the dining room manager, restaurant manager, maybe the hostess, it, it, people doing quality control are, it's assigned to them. What you're really talking about is the quality assurance, which is proactive, right? So what's going into the process of like, do we have our recipes in place? Are we following them? Uh, are our systems right? Do we have good production tools? You know, are we making sure everything is laid out when we set things up for service correctly. 
You know, it's about creation, right? We're that we do nothing in kitchens but create food, right? And so everything that happens in the kitchen, all those processes, all those systems go to make sure that what we're creating comes out the way we want it to. And the best part of this is that this is where you get full team engagement, right? Like everybody has to be a part of quality assurance. If there's a broken system or a system not being used, then things are going to fall apart on the front end. Right. So you have to have every team member involved and engaged. You know, if somebody forgets the production sheets today, well, what are we making? How much are we really going to be able to manage that food waste? So those are things that are going to be really, really important um, as we go through this. Right. And so um, quality assurance and quality control are required, obviously. Um, the second thing on this is we want to review our processes and procedures. Right. Getting that team engagement, team feedback. What are we doing from quality control? What does the input from that look like? So we can review and improve, right? We want to do kind of that uh, constant growth, constant uh, evaluation of what we're doing to make sure that we're there. Um, and then I think the third thing is valuing audits, right? Now, I know most of us who lived in food service for as long as I have dread being audited, because there's so many moving parts that something's always going to be found, right? And I think a lot of us want to be the best we can be, right? We strive for that perfection, if you will. And so being audited sometimes can feel painful. But I think if you really truly evolve and you start to develop and value those audits, it can really help you become better, right? It's not a, I'm going to catch you doing something wrong. It's I want to see what we're missing so we can make sure we do it better the next time around. Yeah. And really just trying to catch people doing something right. You know, that's really just a focus, right? We're looking at a very positive approach where I think, I don't think anybody likes reviews. And <laughs> I, I mean, I never have, I can't imagine anybody else still, but you're right. It's about like just being very positive approach and, hey, you're doing a great job or you're doing this in a way that I hadn't even thought about and it's creating this amazing experience for the, for the resident. Yeah, you know, you're right. And, you know, and everybody wants to see the score, right? And if everybody sees the positive scores and sees that it's great, you know, I'm a praise in public coach in private uh, type of manager. And, and it just goes along with what you said, right? Like use those audit tools, find all the wins and share those as a team. And then when you see the errors, let's figure out how to fix those not necessarily behind closed doors, but let's do that a little more quietly and make it happen with the team. And so you're absolutely right. Catch them doing it right is, is the best way to put that. So That's I know nice. we're getting close time. We'll leave some time for any questions that may come up, but I think it's really important just kind of as we wrap up three points that I want everybody to kind of take away from all of this, right? So first value consistency, right? That consistency is going to come from developing your processes and systems and to be able to manage the most important aspects of the operation, right? Second, remember functionality, right? So your systems, regardless, standard operating procedures, training, whatever, onboarding, all those things, they need to be functional and manageable, and they need to be able to engage employees and keep things in place. And then lastly, happy and engaged, right? We're talking about people because we're in a business of people serving people, right? To just remember that this consistent operation that you've built with your food and beverage program is gonna create great food, happy residents and guests, and you're really gonna engage your employees with it. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Aaron. that was wonderful. Does anyone have any questions for Aaron before we wrap up? Anything that he touched upon or questions regarding Trussell Hospitality Concepts? Okay, well, just a reminder that Aaron works and consults with customers nationwide and Trussell Hospitality Concepts is a boutique food and hospitality consulting firm really dedicated to creating lasting experiences to the residents and the guests and really understanding the impact of the customer satisfaction um, from every angle. So please reach out to Aaron because they really are setting your table for success. This presentation has been sponsored by Belcher Companies. No one knows food service like we know food service. From kitchen renovations, design, equipment, smallwares, and tabletops, 
let's follow your passion. Contact us today. Uh, we will be sending the presentation out to all the registered attendees. But if you have any questions after you've processed this information, uh, please feel free to reach out to either one of us. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Belter. This has been amazing.